Welcome back, everyone. We gathered some amazing visions from our keynote and plenary sessions yesterday. I'm sure all of you are excited about our next keynote session. It is a great honor to have Professor Rosemary Luckin, Professor of Learner-Centered Design, UCL Knowledge Lab, from UCL Institute of Education, University College London, United Kingdom. In today's keynote address, Professor Luckin will guide us through the topic, Enhancing Teaching and Learning with AI Technology and Human Intelligence. She will share the role of technologies, especially AI, in developing an education system that is more resilient to COVID-19. During the presentation, participants may submit your questions in the Q&A box in Zoom. Some of them will be picked for Professor Luckin. I'm sure all of you are already excited. Let's welcome Professor Luckin. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Lam, organizing team for inviting me. I'm so sorry that I can't actually join you in Hong Kong. I would love to be there with you, but unfortunately the restrictions are such that it's not possible. But of course, with technology, we can connect, which is brilliant. I'm just gonna share my screen with you. There we go. Hopefully you can see that. Do shout if not. And it gives me huge pleasure to talk to you about this because it's something I feel passionately about. I think if we get it right, artificial intelligence can be an enormous benefit um, to teachers and learners. And we need to get it right. And I'll explain a little bit about what I mean by that. But I think we can really use it to enhance teaching and learning, particularly if we use our own human intelligence very wisely to make good decisions. And so if I think about what's happened in the last nine months, it's been a turbulent time, hasn't it? We've been conducting uh, a study here in the UK to, to look at the impact that COVID has had on our education system. And it's really interesting watching how over time people's optimism, confidence, anxiety changes. Uh, initially, it's all about safety, then it becomes more about learning loss, then it becomes more concerns about well-being. So there's a whole host of different ways in which the pandemic has changed our education ecosystem. <clears throat> and without technology, it would have been very difficult to provide education at all during lockdown. So there's certainly a foundation that's been laid by the use of technology widely throughout the pandemic for us to build on and try and turn it into a moment for positive transformation. And that's very much what I want to talk about today. So if I think about where we were, you know, we hadn't expected COVID-19. It came not exactly suddenly, we, we could see it coming in the UK and, and there were warnings previously across the world about the possibility of a pandemic but I think it still caught us all by surprise. And so we had scenes like this where we had empty classrooms, we had students learning at home, students learning in the street, you know, some students very upset about not being in school, lots of empty classrooms, and it certainly was enormously disruptive. And I think for many of the educators that we've spoken to, the reaction was, help, what can I do in this situation? This is difficult. I know I want to provide high quality education and I want to do it continuously, but how do I achieve this when everything is unpredictable and we don't know when we're going to be in school, when we're going to be out of school, and in some cases we don't have the infrastructure, the technical and physical infrastructure to be able to reach all our learners. So it certainly was challenging. And I think a good thing to look at is in a situation like this, what kinds of thing can artificial intelligence offer? Now, I'd have to say at this point, that of course, in order to benefit from artificial intelligence, that technical infrastructure does need to be in place. But in many instances, there are AI applications that are available through browsers and could be used on a phone. So sometimes it's not so much about the absolute device, but the connectivity is key. So there are certain limitations in what you can do without that technical connectivity. But if you have some technical connectivity, 
then there are a variety of ways in which the kind of AI systems that are already in place can be very helpful to teachers and to learners. So for example, uh, this is a, um, a system, a couple of examples of different um, systems made by a company called Alelo in the US and their conversation-based systems where the student talks to a character on screen and holds a conversation. On the left of the screen, the system is called N-Skills and it's a system to help students learn English language. It doesn't matter where they are in the world, as long as they've got a browser and a connection, they can connect to end skills, have a conversation. The system uses AI to interpret the speech of the student, work out what's correct, what's not correct, and the avatar character on the screen responds accordingly. And they also used artificial intelligence to adapt the way that the on-screen character reacts to meet the needs of the particular student who is interacting with N skills. And the example on the right is a system that's been designed to help people uh, develop more work-based skills. So to help people develop the kinds of skills, communication skills, ways of interacting, body language that are appropriate in the workplace. So two quite different systems, but both using this very conversational approach where the student can interact seamlessly without the need for too much sophisticated technology. And indeed the founder of Alelo, who was an academic in California before leaving academia to set up his business, has said that the, the, the way in which data can now be collected and analyzed and data is the, the, the food for modern AI has been a game changer in terms of being able to provide adaptive smart technology interactions for students wherever they are. And the second example is one of the systems that um, Carnegie Learning produce. And Carnegie Learning is another uh, university spin-off company um, that's technologies are based in very sound research. And they provide one-to-one -one teaching. This is for college students maths, but they have school age learner systems for mainly STEM subject and language learning, which are areas that are particularly suitable for this kind of AI adaptive individualized tutoring type system. And here's another example, a UK example of a company called Century Tech, um, where they provide a platform that covers all curriculum subjects and adapts to individual students as they progress through the curriculum subject areas. And they use machine learning and some, some thoughts and, and findings from neuroscience to adapt to that individual learner's needs. And so those are uh, 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 examples of systems that use the, the ability of artificial intelligence to be adaptive, to adapt to an individual learner in this instance, and to provide tutoring support, tailored feedback, direction, through a curriculum so that you are given problems to solve that are of appropriate level difficulty for where you are, appropriate subject content, and then you're supported to be successful. Now, another way in which artificial intelligence can help in education are through recommender systems. So uh, if you think about buying a book on Amazon or using one of the very popular um, streaming television services, you're constantly being offered things the system has decided might be suitable for you based on what you've done previously. Well, there are many versions of that kind of system in education where the technology uses artificial intelligence to analyze the interactions that have occurred previously with a particular user, might be a teacher, might be a learner, in order to make recommendations. If it's a teacher, then it will be recommendations of what teaching materials might be suitable for that teacher to use with their class. If it's a learner, it might be recommendations from the system about what resources you need to use next in your learning. And this is an example from a company um, called Filtered. It's 
one of the companies that we've worked with through our Educate program that I'll mention a little later, um, that provides quite a nice uh, chat in interface. So this is an example where the artificial intelligence is used to power a chat interface so that uh, the individual who's using it, the teacher or learner can type in their requests and the system responds. And then the system use artificial, uses artificial intelligence to decide which of the resources available to it, it's going to offer to the teacher or the learner. So this isn't involving tutoring. This is involving finding the right resources to help the student or to help the teacher. And then there are ways in which artificial intelligence can help us when it comes to supporting students, not just in their learning of areas of the curriculum, but also in their well-being, in their mental health. And this is an example actually from the University of Southern California of uh, a system called SimSensei uh, that is a, a virtual avatar based counsellor. You can see the counsellor sitting in a chair on the screen there. And as the counsellor is interacting with the student, SimSensei is collecting data about the student's posture, about their facial expressions, about the way their voice is changing, the tone and the pitch, and analysing this data in real time to provide a back channel to the virtual counsellor of information about whether the student is particularly anxious, uh, whether they're feeling more confident, what their state is, so that the, the virtual counsellor can adapt the advice that's provided according to that student's current state of mind, their current well-being. And that's an interesting use of artificial intelligence that's not subject specific. And of course, in case you were thinking, well, this is about more grown-ups. Of course, there's, 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 there's nice examples of artificial intelligence being used for very, very young learners. Uh, indeed, very young. So this is an example from a company called Oya Labs. And there's a little cloud-based uh, sensor with a, with a sun coming out of it on the screen that sits in an infant's room and analyzes any of the interactions that that young infant has with parents or peers or siblings and analyzes the sounds to provide advice to parents through a phone app about how they can better support their child in the development of their language and cognitive skills. So it's a nice example of the spread of the ways in which artificial intelligence can help. And the final example, again, is something slightly different where the AI isn't obvious. We've been working for, for a while now with a company in the UK called Third Space Learning. And Third Space Learning provides individual tutoring to students currently in the UK from tutors who are based in India and Sri Lanka. Uh, the time zones work out fine for the tutors. The students are at school when they receive the one-to-one -one tutoring and it's face, it's it's person-to-person -person tutoring. It's not face-to-face -face because there's no video, but it's a human tutor connected to a human student and they don't share video, but they use a shared whiteboard for the student to complete activities and audio. And there's no AI in that, obviously, at the interface for either the student or the tutor. But in order for that company to be able to assure to parents, teachers, students, that the quality of the tutoring is very high, they need to be able to constantly evaluate the tutoring, those one-to-one -one sessions. Because we know one-to-one -one sessions can make a huge difference to a learner's progress. And so, what we've been helping them do is look at how they can use artificial intelligence to analyze the interactions, to be able to evaluate where those interactions are being particularly effective as an evaluation mechanism. And then we can use that information to support the tutors to improve the way that they provide the tutoring 
for the students. And so that's a sort of a way in which artificial intelligence is being used in the background to improve the quality of the tutoring interactions that the student is able to receive. So there are examples of the ways in which artificial intelligence, when we have a technical infrastructure that is connected to the internet, can really help students and teachers. Of course, there are costs involved and, and that mustn't be overlooked, but there are certainly a whole range of products and services and more and more coming onto the market that can help, particularly in a situation such as the lockdowns and the restrictions that have happened during the pandemic can help to provide that individual instruction. In addition to which, when students come back to school and it may be difficult to know precisely what each student has done whilst they haven't been at school, AI systems are very good at diagnosing and remediating in that individualized way. And so there's huge potential there. But actually, the potential of artificial intelligence to be really transformational in education goes beyond where we are at the moment. Those systems, good as they are, and the well-designed ones are good, are just a step along the way in our evolution of the relationship between humans and artificial intelligence. And so it's really important to think about the potential. But in order to think about the potential, we have to revisit the notion of what it is to be human intelligent in an AI world in order to really appreciate how different artificial and human intelligence is. Because we don't really want to continually teach and train our young people to do the things that our AI can do really well. We need to help them develop the skills, abilities, knowledge, understanding that will complement what our AI systems can do. So understanding the difference between human intelligence and artificial intelligence is fundamental to understanding how to do that. It's also fundamental to understanding how to build the best AI systems, because again, we want the human and the artificial intelligence to work hand in hand to connect, to really support teaching and learning. So if I was to ask any of you, any of these questions, where have you been this morning? What do you know about Hong Kong? How well do you understand the COVID-19 pandemic? How are you feeling right now? You would have no problem answering those questions. Even if you don't feel you really understand the COVID-19 pandemic, you would be able to understand in that way. This kind of self-reflection, this kind of metacognition uh, is very, very, very difficult for artificial intelligence. And yet it's something we can learn and can develop to a very sophisticated level. And that's something we need to really remember when we're thinking about how we want our AI systems to work within education. We need to remember that AI and human intelligence are very, very different. And we want them to act in a complementary way, not in an identical way. And one of the ways I like to conceptualize our human intelligence in this way that is different from how we think about our artificial intelligence is to think about what we need, what we need to be able to do in order to cope in the 21st century, to be resilient, to, to work with other people, to, to solve complex problems. And I think a good way of looking at it is through these different elements of our human intelligence. This is not different intelligences, it's, it's, it's about a connected, woven set of intelligence elements that all fit together to provide what is particularly special about human intelligence. And so of course we have that academic intelligence that's fundamentally important to helping people gain knowledge and understanding of subject areas. But we need that academic intelligence to be much more interdisciplinary because very few of the problems we face in the world today can be solved by one uh, discipline's expertise alone. Uh, 
if we think about the way that cancer treatment has been transformed by its connection with nuclear medicine, so physics and medicine coming together and many other subject areas in between, if we look at the way that different countries are dealing with the pandemic, it's not just about medicine and science and virology, it's also about logistics and planning and strategy. We need engineers, we need scientists, we need people with expertise in social behavior. So we need people to work together. We can't all understand all subject areas, but what we do need to know is how they connect so that we can be better able to work with other experts from other subject areas. So that interdisciplinary academic intelligence is important. And then meta-knowing intelligence, which is something different to metacognition. For me, meta-knowing is something that could be described by personal epistemology, but that's a, a phrase that people are not very fond of at the moment. So meta-knowing is about understanding what we do know, but also what knowledge is. Where does knowledge come from? What is good evidence that should persuade us that something is true or something is false. In a time of fake news, that's really important. So we do need to help young people understand the fundamentals of what knowledge is and how they can make good decisions about what they believe and what they don't believe. And then social intelligence, fundamentally important. If we're all gonna be working together as interdisciplinary teams to solve big problems, we certainly need social intelligence to help us interact. Then metacognitive intelligence, awareness of our own thinking processes, our ability to regulate the way that we're thinking and interacting, to know when our attention is being diverted and to know how we can bring it back to focus on what we're supposed to be doing. <clears throat> all extremely important. And something that we can learn to do very well. We are not naturally necessarily good at it, but we can learn to do it very effectively. And when we do, we also become very good at that academic intelligence uh, part of our uh, learning as well. Metasubjective intelligence, which is more than emotional intelligence, it's about understanding how we are developing emotional intelligence or how we are not developing emotional intelligence. And the same for the people with whom we're interacting. How are they developing? Are they emotionally intelligent? Do we need to alter the way we're interacting because of where they are in their development of uh, emotional intelligence? And then metacontextual intelligence is a, is a human capacity that I think we overlook a lot of the time. As humans, we're very, very good at moving through the world, really often quite seamlessly between different environments, interacting with different people, talking about different subjects. And we can do this across uh, individual schools, across individual communities, countries, globally, internationally. We can do this really very well. It's incredibly difficult for artificial intelligence. And really, if we get this interwoven set of intelligences properly built and, and integrated, then we can develop this seventh element, this perceived self-efficacy which really requires all of those others, because this is about us as people in the world being able to set goals that are reasonable for ourselves, to know how we can get to those goals, what we may need to learn in order to get there, who might be able to help us, what we know already, accurate understanding of what we know already, and the ability then to move forward, achieve those goals, help other people to achieve those goals. This is what we really need as we develop young people through school, college and university. And so much of this is simply not accessible to artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is very, very useful, but it's nowhere near as smart as human intelligence. And we really do need to remember that and make sure that we don't overestimate what our AI can do and underestimate what our human intelligence is capable of. So what does that mean in terms of the potential for artificial intelligence to move beyond the current state of evolution? Well, the real game changer is this ability for us to collect enormous amounts of data as we interact in the world, to analyze this data with very sophisticated artificial intelligence algorithms and to have the computing power and memory to enable us to do 
that analysis. When I was a PhD student rather a long time ago, we didn't have the computing power and memory that I now have in my smartphone. And if you wanted to run a program of any size, you had to do it overnight so that you didn't disrupt everybody else. It was, it was so, so different. And it's been a huge change. And so not all artificial intelligence is machine learning, but a large amount of the artificial intelligence that's being used at the moment does involve machine learning. And machine learning learns from data. And that's why data has been called the, the new oil. And it's certainly the power between artificial intelligence. And it can also be the power behind our human intelligence and the way that we continue to develop that. Our human intelligence is not finished in its evolution. It's continuing and we need to make sure that we continue that. So if we think about the sort of data that's available to us within education, it's increasingly diverse and it's that diversity that's important. So we can collect data from our phones, potentially from things we're wearing, such as jewelry and clothes, from observational cameras, from good old fashioned interactions with a computer. There's a huge variety of different sorts of data that we can collect. So if I give you a very specific example from uh, the sort of studies that, that my colleagues and I do, you can see these as a group of students collaborating. They're trying to build an interactive toy. This one looks like it's a cat. And we're collecting lots of different sorts of data in order to explore what that data can help us understand about the way these students are or are not collaborating effectively as they're trying to solve this problem of building this interactive toy. And so we've got fiduciary markers on their hands to be able to track hand movement. We're tracking their eye movement. Um, we have, uh, they have a system that they can interact with on um, a, a small handheld device. They can also interact with the computer on the screen as they're programming this toy. There are two sentiment buttons on the table where they can press them when things are going particularly well or not going so well. So there's a lot of potential data sources. But in order to make any sense of those potential data sources, we need to have an understanding from the learning sciences literature about what collaborative problem solving is. So we also came up with this um, framework for collaborative problem solving. And we have three categories of collaboration, establishing and maintaining shared understanding through to maintaining team organization. And then the categories, the six categories of problem solving that we're looking for. And we used this framework with human evaluators who watch the teams and we used this uh, a, a handheld, tool, a handheld tool for them to code the interactions according to these um, collaborative and problem solving dimensions as the coders watch the students. So we certainly collected a huge amount of data. But when it came to analyzing that data, we needed to look for things within the learning science literature that we could identify as proxies for collaborative problem solving. And what do I mean by that? It's one thing to be able to collect a lot of data, but in order to be able to make sense of that data, you need to be able to connect that data to the thing you're looking for. So in this instance, we were trying to understand collaborative problem solving. And so we needed to break down collaborative problem solving into those collaborative and problem solving elements, but then to break it down further so that we could look, for example, for nonverbal signifiers of collaborative problem solving, because that's the kind of data that's very easy to collect and relatively easy to analyze using machine learning algorithms. So when we looked at the learning sciences literature, there were some possibilities that we could look for. Now I need to stress here that I'm not suggesting any one of these or even two or three of these is enough on their own to tell us that a group of students are effectively collaborative problem solving. But if you imagine a whole set of proxies, then we can really start to unpack the way in which the students are being effective or are not in both their collaboration and their problem solving. So in this example, we looked at synchrony, were the students looking at the same thing? Were the, was, it, was their gaze synchronous? Were their hand movements synchronous? Were they accountable individually for what they were doing? Was there equality when it came um, to, to taking direction and giving direction or was it very one-sided? 
and what was the variance between the different students. So to look at one of these particularly, we'll look at um, synchrony. We also wanted to know, for example, not just was a student looking at the same thing as one of the other students or was one student looking at another student but also were they active or passive and so we came up with a coding system for active or passive and when we look at synchrony uh, previous literature suggests that hand tracking eye tracking is associated correlated with effective collaboration and so that's where we decided to focus our attention and in order to make judgments, we built a system using machine learning algorithms that would analyze the data we collected to look at synchrony in hand movement and in eye gaze. But we also asked, an, asked an expert human evaluator to watch the groups of students, to watch videos of the groups of students, in fact, somebody independent from our project. And for each uh, two minutes that the students were interacting to decide whether at that point in time the team was being effective in the way that they were collaborating to solve the problems. So we had the human experts evaluation of the teams and then we had the data about the synchrony of hand movement and eye movement. And these charts represent this comparison. So where it says high, low, high CPS, collaborative problem solving, that's the evaluation for this particular time frame that our human expert gave. And where you can see the lines, when the lines are close together, the synchronous activity between the students and where the lines are further apart, there's a lack of synchrony. And so what we found was a very high correlation between what the human evaluator had said and what the data was saying, which gave us good evidence to believe that a useful proxy would be synchron synchronicity. Now, obviously we would need to look for many more proxies to be able to reach real conclusions about collaborative problem solving, but it was a start. And if we can imagine that start scaled up enormously, if we can imagine a system where we are constantly collecting multimodal, very rich data as students interact in the world and algorithms that are designed such as ours was in that example, informed by what the learning science literature is telling us so that we can look for proxies when there's a good chance there's good evidence that we can believe that that proxy in the example i gave you synchronicity is associated with the overall concept that we're trying to analyze in our example collaborative problem solving if you can imagine that system and then that system complemented by the human intelligence of teachers, learners, parents, employers, as they understand more and more how to interpret that data, then I believe we can develop something very exciting as, as an intelligence infrastructure that really combines our human and our artificial intelligence capacity and capability to power all of our interactions. It might be through virtual or augmented reality, might be through robots, might be in the workplace, but it could also be when we're on our own simply reading a book because that intelligence infrastructure has helped us understand much more about how we can effectively read that book, what we're looking for in that book, what we already know and what we need to understand from that book. And this intelligence infrastructure can also empower those oh so valuable interactions between the human and the student, the teacher, the student, the mentor, the mentee, because the mentor understands the student's needs more because of what they've learned from the intelligence infrastructure. And this would be a great combination of artificial and human intelligence that would be a little like electricity was the power or the objects that, that run in our homes and in our schools. If you can think about this as electricity for for, for learning, this intelligence infrastructure, the infrastructure that can power all of our learning interactions, then I think we would really be in a position to transform our education systems. 
But how could we bring that about? That's a complicated thing to bring about. At the moment, we're very much at the stage of individual AI applications and systems. How do we move to this intelligence infrastructure? I think personally, there's only really one way that we can build something truly effective. And that's through much greater collaboration across multiple stakeholders. So bringing together the people who are building the AI systems with the teachers and the learners who use these AI systems, with the learning, research, learning science researchers who understand the evidence about what might work, the evidence that can be used to inform the design of the algorithms by the AI developers, and also who can help ensure that all the time as a system is being developed, we're constantly asking, is it working? How do we know it's working? Because we're constantly collecting data and evidence and probing it in a way that will help us understand if it's working. And certainly that collaborative aspect of bringing multiple stakeholders together is absolutely at the heart of our Educate programme. Educate programme is a training programme for startups and small businesses that's been running initially in London at University College London between 2017 and 2019, and it'll be running again in London um, from next year. And what we do is we try and build this golden triangle. We try and build the right connections between the people who develop the technologies, the people who understand how those technologies work and what the existing evidence says, and the people who are using those technologies. Because we believe if we really can build that golden triangle, then we can certainly improve the education technology products and services. And this is so true for artificial intelligence as well as ed tech more generally. Because what we really need is these participatory design through multi-stakeholder partnerships so that we help educators to understand more about AI. We help AI developers understand more about teaching and learning because many of them don't know anything about teaching and learning. And we enable that through the research community. So it's getting these communities to work together and at the core is that data, evidence and research using the data effectively to build the systems, using the data effectively to tell us if those systems are or are not working. But we also need to do one other thing, and I think we need to do this really rather urgently. We need to help our education organisations understand much, much more about AI so that they make good decisions about where to use AI within their organisations. So we've developed um, a program which we call ethical because it's very important. It's an acronym, but it's also really important to think about ethics all the time when we're, we're talking about data and AI. Of the seven steps that organizations need to go through in order to really get themselves into a position of being ready for AI so that they're seeing their institution, their organization through a data and AI lens. And they can then make much, much, much better decisions about how AI can help them in their particular context. And so the first step is very much about bringing the community on board because you need everybody to understand why you're going through this process. Then it's about selecting particular challenges, educational challenges that you're facing, identifying the kinds of data you already have, the new data you could collect, analyzing that data using some smart AI techniques to help you understand the challenge more. Then you can make decisions about how you tackle that challenge with AI. Is it a challenge that's suitable for AI? I'm going to give you one very oversimplified example because otherwise it would be impossible to do in a short period of time. And this is one uh, driven from looking at, at higher education, but it's true of education wherever you are. One of the things you want to do in a pandemic is ensure that you're providing a continuous high quality teaching and learning experience. So how could you do that? And this is where we stress that there are two questions. How can AI help us to understand the problem more? That's the AI readiness. And then how can we use AI to help us solve the problem? And you need to do the first before the second. And here I'm just focusing on that first one. So we developed a set of criteria that you can use 
when you're looking at a particular challenge and, and think about, well, is this one that it would be good to do the AI readiness process on? And here are the criteria, but perhaps more usefully, here are the criteria for that example. So if we're thinking about continuity of teaching and learning, yes, that's something that could be AI compatible. We probably know something about it. We could know more. It's not necessarily very controllable because um, we can't be in charge of everybody all of the time. And we, there is a lot of uncertainty because we still don't know how in this example, the pandemic may roll out and continue to impact and disrupt education. Probably already have some data. We could certainly collect some more. We'll need to think about how accurate we could be. We need to find out, does the particular institution have an appetite for change? Because if they don't, then we might find out something very useful, but if they're not interested in changing, it might be difficult to bring about any transformation. And is this an important problem? Absolutely crucial continuity of teaching and learning. And we need to think about the vast array of different sorts of data that we could collect, because that's really important in trying to understand the problem. And so we need to combine behavioral data with historical data, with log data, if we can get it with multimodal data. And if we can do that right, then in actual fact, we can start to build models of the different interactions that are happening. We can build interaction profiles and we can look at the way those interactions are or are not being effective and then unpick what those interactions are made up from to try and help everybody develop more effective interactions. So it's really doing at an organizational level what we currently do with AI at a much lower, more focused area in a particular subject domain, for example. And I think if we do that, then we can profile the different interactions and we can look at the different characteristics and create different ways of promoting a particular profile of interaction for a particular profile of student. And that really helps us to understand how we can provide that educational quality through disruptive situations like the pandemic. So the core to being AI ready is really about mapping this uh, knowledge wisdom pyramid so that we, we move from the data through information, through knowledge and through wisdom. We must look at what's happened previously and we must identify appropriate data sources. We must analyze them very carefully in a very context specific way so that we can really develop that wisdom about the situation. And just before I finish, I have to flag up the, the warning light. I've been very, very positive about AI because I do believe there's huge potential, but one mustn't shy away from the fact that there are of course risks and, and it's, through recognition of those risks that we formed the Institute for Ethical AI in Education. And there's a link to that, to that uh, organization here. Um, we're due to um, produce our final report in February next year. And that's trying to help the education ecosystem, the developers, the teachers, the learners, the policymakers understand how we can better assure that we get the benefits and reduce the risks when it comes to AI. And I'm going to leave that final slide up there with a few conclusions from the talk, um, because I'm hoping there might be some questions for me to answer. I will have a look in the chat. <laughs> so thank you for inspiring sharing, Professor Luckin. And we will now take some questions. My from pleasure. The Please submit your questions in the Q&A box in Zoom if you have any, and some of them will be picked for Professor Luckin. So we have our first question. Uh, Marianne from the audience would like to ask, how do you measure whether the student is learning through AI? Is there a tool that you can use in doing so and how? Good question. And one of the things that AI systems, so if you think about those systems I was showing early on in the talk, um, the, the, the system where um, N skills, where you had somebody learning English interacting with an avatar character on the screen, all of the time, that software will be collecting evidence about how correctly the student is using their English language skills. So the system itself will be evaluating the accuracy of what the student is doing and then providing that feedback to the student and to teachers. And that's one of the really useful things about 
that kind of tutoring AI application. So the Alelo examples, the, the Carnegie Learning examples, the, the Century Tech examples, and there are thousands of them out there. The systems that are well designed uh, will not just tailor the interaction to the needs of the students, also provide constant feedback to that student, but will be always evaluating how that student is progressing and feeding that back to the teacher, to the learner, to the parents. So it's inbuilt in the system to look at uh, how we can measure the, the extent to which um, the student is or is not learning. When we think about the infrastructure that I was talking about, the intelligence infrastructure, then again, that's where the human and the artificial must come together because we need the humans to interpret what the AI is telling us about the learner in order to understand all the time that continuous formative feedback that's potentially available because the system is continually feeding back to the tutor or indeed to the student themselves, how that student is progressing. And not just in terms of whether they are now able to, for example, solve a quadratic equation, but also are they resilient? Are they confident? Do they understand what they've achieved? We can also start to build that kind of feedback for teachers into the infrastructure so that we have a much better idea about the learning progress, the process, not just the product. We also have another question by Vivian. She would like to ask for your views on the quality control and quality assurance using AI in education. Yes, I think it's a really important um, issue and, and it does relate to the ethics because in the same way that I think it would be unethical not to try and leverage the benefit of artificial intelligence for education. We do have to make sure that the way that we use it is ethical. And for me, that means it needs to be good quality. It needs to be genuinely supporting the teaching and learning process. So I think <clears throat> it has to be part of that ethical framework that needs to be in place. So that would consist of certainly some kind of regulation, some kind of legal framework, but it also needs to involve an education framework where we provide the people who are developing the AI with good guidelines to help them assure quality. But we also help the teachers, learners, parents who are using the AI to understand how they can make better decisions about whether or not this particular flavor of AI is one that's suitable for them. So it's really a combination of uh, regulation and education because unfortunately the regulation will never be able to keep up with the speed of change of the technology and sadly with the fact that there'll always be some people in the world who want to do harm. I wish it wasn't the case but, but, but unfortunately it is. So yes we need good regulatory frameworks but we also need that education in place so that we understand what's happening and can make much better decisions. And one of our audience would also like to know that, are you seeing young children learning through AI in the near future? Which aspects would AI be able to support young children in their learning and development? Another good question, they're all good questions. Um, I think, yes, absolutely. Um, young children can benefit enormously, uh, particularly with, with, with basic numeracy and literacy. AI is great at an individualizing support for numeracy and literacy. And now we have the kind of AI where we really can analyze speech much more accurately than we could even five years ago, even three years ago. And so if you can imagine a, a child reading to an AI system and having an AI system that can help support the child as they're reading because the AI system is able to analyze that child's speech, knows about the kinds of words where that child might have problems, can it therefore make um, smart decisions about how to provide support. There's huge potential for AI to be, to be used with young children. But I also think it's important not to see AI as something that always needs to be in our face. 
I don't perceive the future to be one in which everybody's constantly using a, a visible piece of technology. We're all plugged into iPads or, or our phones or, or, or laptops. I think often it's, it's, it's improved by the visible tech disappearing because it's actually the data and the analysis of that data being fed back to teachers to help them mentor students more wisely because they've got much more information at their fingertips. As a teacher, that's something I really look forward to. So yes, of course, people will be interacting with technology, but it's also about that, that ability of AI to analyze huge amounts of data and tell us what that data can, can help us understand about the learning process so as that we as educators can better support our students. And that's as applicable to young children as it is to adults and older students too. Another one of our audience would also like to ask, uh, as you've just discussed upcoming technology in higher education, have you or UCL ever considered the role of blockchain in education? I have, yes, and I think there's, there's, there's definitely potential and there are quite a few companies who are looking at blockchain as a way of um, credentialing students for performing particular things and, and, and creating um, an individual portfolio of credentials that's secure um, and can be um, transported, owned by the individual. And I think there's, there's, there's definitely some potential there. But I think perhaps one of the, the issues we need to tackle prior to that is the issue of, of who owns the data. And for me, I think we have to move towards a situation where the learner, the person themselves, the, the, the person whose data is being collected and analyzed really needs to own that data. Now, obviously that's impossible for very, very young children, so then we have to look at parental or caregiver responsibility. But certainly I think if we could develop a system that was much more um, based on human ownership, and certainly there are some companies who are looking at that, the technology behind that, you know, in very sophisticated ways at the moment, then that would make a move towards blockchain perhaps more logical and more straightforward. Not necessarily technically, but but uh, or not just technically, um, but in terms of people's understanding, perspective, and acceptance of the technologies. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Professor Luckin. Pleasure. Thank yeah. you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you.